think something like three quarters of of all new identified diseases come from animals. So it's it's sort of a a message that we need to be aware of how we're interacting with the the other animals in the world, whether that's wild animals, whether that's farmed animals, you know. This is Defender Radio. Michael Howie, and this is Defender Radio, the podcast for wildlife advocates and animal lovers brought to you by the Fur Bearers. It's been a while, hasn't it? The last time I posted an episode, it was February, and a global health emergency was landing hard in Canada and the United States. Now, since then, we've learned a lot about the novel coronavirus that causes COVID-19, but a lot of questions remain you're probably not going to get the answers to those questions on this podcast. But what you are going to hear is a solid summary of what we know about coronavirus and its link to animals. A conversation about the difficulty in media rapidly disseminating scientific information and how ready some North Americans are to make big lifestyle changes as a result of the virus. Tom Beggs, a research scientist with Faunalytics, joined Defender Radio last week to discuss general information about the coronavirus and animal advocacy in the time of coronavirus, as well as the results and analysis of a fascinating U.S. poll regarding public knowledge on coronavirus and its animal links. Before we dive in, I want to remind everyone that this information should never replace that given by health professionals, and neither myself nor the interview participant is a health professional. For up-to-date information on COVID-19 in your community, please seek your municipal, provincial, or state, or the Health Canada coronavirus websites. American listeners, give that old CDC website a check. The place I thought makes sense to start is as of today, which is May 15th, and this isn't going to be out until next week, but about now, where are we at what we know about coronavirus and COVID-19 and its relationship to animals? Right, yeah. Uh, So just full disclosure, I'm not an epidemiologist, I'm not a virologist, um, but it looks like we're still pretty much in early days. Um, We do know some stuff about it, right? We know it likely originated in that wet market um, in China um, where live and dead, both farmed and wild animals were were kept in close uh, quarters to each other. And that's sort of an environment that can allow viruses to jump from one species to another species that really those two species might never interact with each other in nature, right? Mm -hmm. So we've created this sort of artificial environment that can allow diseases to propagate um, from their switching between species and, and ultimately to humans. Um, And so we're, we're, we're certainly aware that, you know, animals in, in tight quarters um, and wild animals can carry diseases that, that humans haven't experienced before. And I think something like three quarters of, of all new identified diseases come from animals. Um, so it's it's sort of a a message that we need to be aware of how we're interacting with the the other animals in the world, whether that's wild animals, whether that's farmed animals. You know, again, tight spaces, a lot of animals of the same um, same species, all in really sort of crammed, dirty quarters, is another breeding ground and leads to things like antibacterial resistance in drugs or to drugs. Um, so. Generally, um, I think it's it's a reflection of how humans interact with animals. Um, yeah, I think that's a great summary and something I've heard from a lot of epidemiologists, uh, both prior to this pandemic and since this pandemic was yeah. told you so. I, I <laughs> like it's it is the ultimate moment for epidemiologists. I remember interviewing um, yeah. Dr. Isha Akhtar a couple of years ago. Um, and she has recently left military service, but she worked CDC and military stuff. Brilliant, brilliant person. And right. she and I spoke about uh, a book she had written talking about how animal agriculture is like yeah. it, it is the perfect breeding ground for new viruses and uh, for mutations and all of that kind of stuff. Because it is it's if you were to create the perfect <laughs> scenario for a virus, that's what yeah. it is. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it, it, it makes sense that, you know, there's a lot of sort of new information coming at us. And something that I've noticed uh, with my background in media and attempting to learn about science 
is yeah. the media is very desperately trying to give out information. And the problem is that information is changing in an almost daily basis, whether we're talking about science or policy. Um, yeah. I think of particular concern, at least from my perspective, um, is the fact that I'm listening for what Doug Ford here in Ontario is saying, but I'm also then hearing, uh, you know, what Dr. Be uh, Bonnie Hendry is saying in BC. And I'm hearing what the epidemiologists in Alberta and Saskatchewan have to say. And it's this, yeah. this weird mix. Um, and, and the one in our email that I, I, I post, I, I wrote you, um, before our interview that I found interesting was the graphic and, and our listeners may have heard that, seen this one and you may have seen this one, the graphic of someone running and showing yeah. the, the aerosolized virus behind them in their breath. Yeah. And then the next week I heard, and again, I think it was Dr. Bonnie Hendry. I will look that up and put it in the show notes, but someone said you're not going to get sick running past someone outside. So it's okay to go outside. Yeah. So my question for you is what's up with that? <laughs> from a scientific um, point of view yeah I, to be perfectly honest it's completely normal for mm -hmm. there to be dissenting opinions within the scientific community for there to be one study that sort of points in one direction and another study that points in another direction to have people saying well yes we have this information from the study but here's how we should interpret it um Right now, the whole world is focused on this. And like you say, media outlets are jumping on every little tidbit as quick as they can to get the get the jump. And people are interested, right? Mm -hmm. Like they, they hear a new piece of information and they think, hey, that can help me to keep myself safe, keep my family safe, give me a leg up, whatever it may be. Um, but from a scientific perspective, like those those different perspectives aren't necessarily a bad thing. It's just a question of um, how they're reported, right? So yeah. within the scientific community, things are always sort of hedged where, you know, we use language like this study suggests that, and you'll use that language in a, in a study with, you know, a large sample and a good methodology, but it still just suggests. It doesn't demonstrate, it doesn't prove, it just suggests, right? Uh, but sometimes that sort of gets lost in the media. And, you know, I feel for the epidemiologists who are who are trying to come up with recommendations in these sort of shifting times. Um, I think probably our best bet is to to listen to those health professionals, though. Yeah. Um, even, you know, some, you know, one province might take this road to it and another province might take another stance. Um, but it's really their job to not just look at, you know, one study that came out, um, but sort of look at the sum total of the evidence available. And so go, well, we think it's within this realm. Understanding, like, it's it's a volatile, changing situation um, where there's lots of new information coming out, where even information, like, normally, you know, if you hit the scientific literature um, and find a study from, like, two months ago, that's on your topic of interest. You're, you're ecstatic because that's absolutely the best information. But with COVID, we've learned so much so quickly that, you know, a study from two months ago, you're immediately kind of skeptical and going, well, what else have we learned? And I, I think it's a good thing because it's a testament to just how much research is being done where people mm -hmm. are, are trying to figure it all out. But yeah, it can be definitely overwhelming. Um, and so I think, you know, to a certain extent, just sort of taking that top line you know, what's Health Canada saying, right? Like, what are their recommendations? They, they're they aware of all these studies, right? They've, they've had a look at them. What's the CDC saying? Um, and, and listening to those high-level epidemiologists who, you know, and, and the controversy around the running study was we don't know exactly what size of drop is sufficient to carry the virus. We don't know what size of drop is sufficient to infect somebody. And so, in that absence of knowledge, we don't really know whether or not you need to be worried about a running slipstream or not, right? And so it's we'll learn more as we go and have have better answers as we go. Mm -hmm. um, but for now, I'd say yeah, just listen to the professionals. You know, when in doubt, err on the side of caution. But yeah, things are things are going to change for sure. Yeah, and that's definitely something I've uh, I've heard about from science communicators. Um, uh, I'm not sure if you consider yourself a science communicator, but you are communicating well and no science, so. <laughs> Uh, but that that is something I've heard from groups I participate in is the need to understand the language used by scientists versus the language used by politicians on these issues. Uh, and it yeah. is it's it's as a person caught in this like everybody else. It is so frustrating 
to hear yeah. one day, all right, don't go running. <laughs> look at this picture. Oh my God. Yeah. Oh my God. Oh my God. And then the swell of it on social media, because it's a compelling graphic. And then yeah. by the time people actually get to do what the science, the scientific processes of retesting and questioning and examining and so on and so forth. Then we get to the, what you're saying of, well, we don't really know yet. Um, yeah. But let's just be cautious for now, uh, which is it is difficult in a time of uncertainty to be told we're uncertain. Um, but that's uh, that's just again, it's this it's kind of an unprecedented situation. Um, and, and talking yeah. about what people know, your study was very interesting to me um, and, or your poll, I'm sorry. And. Yeah. Uh, I'd love to jump into that. And the first one, and I use the term market penetration because that's the word that jumped into my head. Um, right. Yeah. But people's understanding of what wet markets are. And I've had personal yeah. conversations with people um, about this. What did you find that people knew about or didn't know about wet markets? Yeah. So we started our poll. Um, so this is a poll done late March with an American sample. It was run by Ipsos Reid. A um, thousand um, Americans participated. Um, and our very first question was was asking, you know, what's the origin of this disease? Mm -hmm. Right. And so, you know, we're not looking for like a specific geographic region. We're just sort of looking to see what people knew, where they thought this thing came from. Right. Um, and we found that a decent chunk of people mentioned animals in some way, but only 16% mentioned wet markets um, in some form or fashion. Um, so I, I think there's, and I think to a certain extent, it's, you know, a question of how is the media reporting on this? Sometimes you hear, you know, it originated in this region in China. Sometimes you hear it originated at a market in China. Sometimes you hear a wet market, but that term isn't really explained. And there's sort of confusion around what the term actually means. Mm -hmm. um, but to have sort of 16% of the population or of the sample, sorry, that we, uh, of our sample, just sort of spontaneously on their own when we said, hey, what's the origin of this thing mentioning that um, is, is pretty low, right? And we had, you know, an, I think it was something like 9% who, you know, talked about it being man-made or coming from a lab, right? So yeah. the, 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 the difference between those two... And that was before, to be honest, before that conspiracy theory really sort of gained a lot of its legs. Um, so I think that's one of the things um, when we're looking at what needs to be done around um, the outbreak and messaging for, for people interested in animals and, and animal advocates is that it's, it's really a time for, for education um, because people aren't necessarily even understanding the conditions at the wet market that that led to that jumping presuming that is you know exactly what happened like there's some evidence of pangolin and bats and mm -hmm, cross mm -hmm. species and that kind of stuff so presuming that's accurate um you know people's understanding of that is is reasonably um poor or has been and their linking of that to um to like traditional livestock is is even more sort of disconnected, right? Mm -hmm. um, so we think, based on our our study results, that you know, getting to get just getting people more sort of educated on the origins rather than you know starting to to push for for messages. Although other research has shown that um, that there is. Um, fairly good support for messaging around wet market bans. Now, yeah. how well do people understand what that term means? Because the wet market, right, just means that groceries like fresh produce yep. is sold, right? And so a lot of markets meet that definition. So what exact type of markets are we talking about? How can we reduce harm uh, the best way we can for animals and protecting humans going forward as well, right? Well, Matt, I was wondering too, do you think people's understanding of what, I mean, because we're going from do you kind of know what a wet market is into, mm -hmm. do you understand what it is? So yes, they may have heard it in the media. Yeah. Um, and yes, there may be passing reference to it, but do they understand this is not some strange foreign entity? That's yeah. Like this, this is quite similar to a lot of stuff we have around the world yeah. in some ways. And something you mentioned, and this is when I said, I've been talking with friends about this, um, people not understanding there are farmed animals 
at these wet markets. Yeah. This this is yeah. not just random wildlife that's been caught. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I didn't actually realize. Um, I think there was a Vox video um, where they sort of walked through and mm. China after another outbreak, <laughs> banned um, banned some wildlife and but there was still demand and so people started farming. Um, I think pangolins are, are farmed a fair bit now, right? And so the the line between you know what's considered exotic, what's wild, what's farmed, um, and you know there have been um, outbreaks from chicken farms and hog farms, right? So yep. it doesn't have to be this exotic species. It's just a, a question of how we're dealing with the animals that we share the planet with, right? So and that's the the. the bemusing i suppose is the best word for it. <laughs> reality for me is as a journalist i covered h1n1 h2n5 i covered yeah. these outbreaks and the the fear that came with them and that's yeah. why i think i get so frustrated when i see people now um sort of ignoring some of this information so this isn't new we yeah. as i said you know epidemiologists they've been calling <laughs> this out for uh, at least a decade well over a decade yeah. We're talking in yeah. the 90s, they were talking about this stuff, at least. So that's, I, I think that's sort of, it's an interesting, interesting connection, uh, which, which also leads into the question I had about um, the cognitive, I use the term cognitive distortion, which is from yeah. uh, uh, my CBD for anxiety, um, but it's, uh, or CBT, sorry. Um, okay. <laughs> yeah, different. Both yeah. beneficial, one more specifically yeah. to this cognitive distortion. This topic, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, it was the whole, the concept of people are saying, yeah, you know, I'd, I'd support better animal welfare laws. And yeah, I'd support a wildlife mm -hmm. ban. And they seem willing to support this. But then there's also this lack of awareness of like the pigs in the United States and Canada, the chickens in the United States and Canada are in conditions that could, yeah. in theory, lead to this kind of problem, too. Um, oh, yeah. That the fast food joints are mass-producing animals uh, and transporting them all over the world. Uh, like, all of this kind of stuff. Yeah. Is this something we know a lot about at this time? Uh, and if not, how do we kind of get through that wall? Yeah, it's it's definitely an area of research, Um and so you're right, people will use cognitive distortions or another term people might have heard is cognitive dissonance or mm -hmm. dissonance reduction or motivated reasoning. Um, the, the general term is meet, the meat paradox, right? And so it's the idea that people enjoy the taste of meat, cultural traditions around meat, what have you, um, but also in some sense feel bad, right? They, they understand um, that you know, this was at one point a living, breathing animal. Um, and so there's a series of, of things that we can do. We call them moral distancing strategies, right? Where you can try to remove the, the reality of eating meat from the reality of where meat comes from, right? Mm -hmm. So things, you know, so simple as like euphemisms where we call it beef instead of, instead of eating a cow, right? Uh, but other things too, like, you know, people think, well, you know, barnyard animals are really not that bright, right? They're not very intelligent animals at all. When that's not true, right? Mm -hmm. The pig is as smart as your dog is. And, um, or they think uh, they don't really suffer. They don't, they don't feel pain the way, you know, the way I do. Right. And so it's a way to sort of divorce those two realities from each other. Right. Um, in terms of how you break through, um, it's something we're actually looking at um, because we want to understand um, what types of, of distancing beliefs people have, what types of strategies they're using. Yeah. So we're actually looking at right now in a current study, uh, a study of people's beliefs around chicken and fish, right? So, you know, fish don't feel, feel pain. Chickens aren't social animals. They don't care for you. They're young. And we wanted to see how prevalent these are. And then we wanted to see how strongly each of those beliefs relates to somebody's willingness to sign a petition, right? Mm -hmm. To help improve the lives of farm chicken, right? So, um, or to reduce their own consumption, right? So we had the option to, for people to, to, to pledge to reduce their, their consumption of each animal. Um, and we think that by learning about which beliefs 
people have, which are those kind of problematic beliefs, um, we can help advocates to target their messaging, right? So if we know, you know, well, people don't really understand X or Y about pigs or fish or chicken, um, let's educate them on that. And then that sort of starts to chip away at that um, the moral distancing, chip away at the neat paradox and, and help them see those creatures in a, in a different light, right? So that's sort of one of the ways we go about it at Fondomatics, where our goal is to do research that, that helps animal advocates to be as effective as possible. Um, so certainly understanding sort of how people view animals um, and the, the beliefs that they have around them are, are, are essential to those efforts. Um, and I've got two questions that are kind of can go in either order. So I'm going to skip ahead a little uh, talking about sure. methodology in general. Yeah. Again, I am not a scientist. I do not have a scientific <laughs> background. Yeah. However, I do communicate a lot on this subject and I hear a lot of people complain. So if there is polling, well, your methodology was wrong or <laughs> you use this selection of people from this service, which shows some kind of bias or this or that. And I mean, the one thing I, I feel confident in saying is there's no such thing as no bias. Um, right. It's just, it's inevitable. But how do you manage that kind of stuff in, in, in yeah. some, in a topic that is so divisive too? It's not a, mm -hmm. you know, do you prefer blue or light blue? <laughs> so how, how do you manage that to ensure it's not, or to mitigate how much it's impacting your results? Right. Yeah. So I, I think to a certain extent, and this goes back to the idea of, of cognitive dissonance or motivated reasoning, mm -hmm. right? Where if I believe something and you come to me with information that questions that thing I believe, I am motivated to disbelieve that information, right? And it's really easy to cast aside a study that you don't like. Because if you, if you go ahead of it and say, well, I don't like this, there must be something wrong with it. No scientific study is ever perfect. No poll is perfect, mm -hmm. right? Um, so if you're motivated to sort of get rid of, of that information so that it doesn't have to alter your worldview, there's a t whole host of things that humans are, are capable of using to do so, right? Um, in terms of how do you deal with it as a scientist, um, obviously as much rigor as possible, right? So. You know, you've heard the the old uh, line. Well, there's there's lies, damn lies, and statistics. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I feel like statistics get a bad name, but it's it's really a tool like any other tool, right? So just like you can use a hammer to build a house, or you can use it to smash your neighbor's car because they angered you in some way. In in you you wouldn't look at the neighbor's car and see it all smashed up and say, oh well, hammers are bad, right? Instead, it's well, that's a misuse of a hammer. Um, and so for, for scientists and for people trying to get information, um, accurate information, the question is, was the tool used appropriately? Was, was this, was, were the statistics run appropriately? And so you're looking for things like samples that are, that are random, uh, random samples that are representative of whatever population you're looking for, whether that's, you know, everybody in Canada. So you want to make sure we didn't get way too many men and not enough women or um, way too few people of color or whatever, or way too many people from the north and not enough from the south, not that mm. that would ever be the case in Canada. Uh, but you want to make sure that your, your sample is accurate to the group of people that you're, you're looking to get and that you're using a reputable um, reputable source for collecting um, that data. And that doing that gives you more confidence, right? So in science, and in some ways, I think we'd be better served if we didn't say, well, 46% of X or Y, but if we said, well, between 43 and 49% yeah. of X or Y, because there's always that confidence interval, but it's sort of hidden in that disclaimer at the bottom where you see this, this survey is accurate within plus or minus three percentage points, 19 times out of 20, that kind of language that sort of gets skipped over. But to be honest, seeing that information is also uh, an indicator of the poll's quality, that it means that they're taking that variability into account. So all of which to say, um, you know, get your information from a reputable source, um, know what to look for in, in survey data if you're not sure. Um, yeah, and, and the people writing the poll and delivering the poll need to be 
aware of of the potential pitfalls of using that tool, right? Yeah, and I think I, I got to think too from again from a media perspective, people are just besieged yeah. by surveys and things like that, and it doesn't help. Um, again, in my professional opinion, when Toronto Star runs a poll on its website and then right. runs an oh, article yeah. about that poll, it's like, well, right. yeah, but <laughs> like I know, you know, our listeners know for a fact, most of these are right. very narrow issues where both sides are represented by an advocate for that side who then send yeah. out an email or, you know, social media request to their supporters to say, hey, come vote yeah. on this poll. Like, yeah. you know, you see that and it's like, well, yeah. And if you watch MSNBC and 95% of NS MNSBC or MSNBC viewers think Donald Trump's doing a poor job, it's like, yeah, no kidding. It's MSNBC. Right. Like, you know, it's, yeah. it's one of those, I think, where you have to also understand the frustration of the user end of it. Um and that's again, but that's exactly what you said. Of that's why it's so important to say it's thirty nine to forty nine, not forty six. Uh, like right. when you and build in the variability, I think people say, "Well, okay, there's there's wiggle room here." There's wiggle room, and that 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 question of who did we actually ask? Yeah, right. So the two, probably the two biggest issues are who did we actually ask and how did we ask them, right? So you can ask the wrong people or people who aren't representative of Americans or Canadians like the star, people who read the star and go to that website, mm -hmm. probably not accurate, right, for, for the whole country, people from Toronto, right, generally. Um, and then how did you how did you phrase the question, right? Was it leading? Did, did you write it in a way that no reasonable person would disagree and say, aha, look, everybody agrees with me on this. Yeah. And it's like, well, but, you know, the question you asked wasn't really a fair question, right? And so, yeah, it's, I, I, I guess I, I it, it, maybe it's part of the the twenty four hour news cycle or whatever it is, or the 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 wanting to have a, a jump on on the earliest information and and to give people information that they're looking for. But yeah, to some degree, you know, slowing down and and doing a better job of these things would be a better service than these sort of quick. Oh you know, yeah, that well, yeah. I, that's I I very openly say that I believed when I was running a newsroom that it was better to have it right than to have it first. Mm. And that was right near the end of my media career. So, <laughs> I, I, you know, I don't know. Yeah. And calling out your colleagues for misinformation on wildlife and environmental issues. But I'm not bitter. Um, <laughs> and on that note, pivoting back to the poll. Um, yeah. Based on what you have read, what you have analyzed from this polling, is this an opportunity? For, for us, for nonprofits, for animal lovers, for environmentalists, for change makers and policymakers to really illustrate, like, this is going on here. These are issues that we have to face. Like, I just put out a thing about uh, there are 13 mink farms in British Columbia, and they have not been inspected since 2018, at least 2018, right. despite the fact that for the last two months, they've known that mink farms can carry coronavirus. And now there are four mink farms in Netherlands with coronavirus. Is this an opportunity for nonprofits to say like, yeah, these are issues facing us in Canada and the United States. This is not happening just in China or just in wherever the subject of the day is. Yeah. Yeah. So we think it's, it's definitely an opportunity. And that's sort of one of the main questions that advocates had for us. So we went to advocates and said, Hey, what questions do you guys have? And that's sort of the basis for the poll. Um, we think it's an opportunity, but we think we're at the education stage, right? Where, you know, as I said, only 16% of people mentioned the wet markets just unprompted and only a third knew that the virus likely spread because animals were kept in close quarters. Yeah. If, if you have something, you know, where you can, can package it fairly easily and say, hey, look, you know, uh, mink can, can contract and transmit. I'm not sure if we have that information yet, but can be a carrier of coronavirus and there are mink farms in BC. Um, that's a fairly easy piece of information to, to give people. And we did find... Uh, we presented people with a, a, a paragraph where we actually informed them um, about some of those those links to animal agriculture. And the good news was that the majority of people considered it. Um, uh, they said that it was, sorry, that it was, oh, they, they found it convincing. Um, mm -hmm. Yes, yes, um, yeah. Right. 
Um, and so we took that as good news um, that, that the majority of people found it logical and convincing. Um, we took that as good news that it could be used to, to educate people and to help move them along. So if you had a, um, some information like that where you could say, mink are a carrier, there are mink farms in BC, um, and you have sources for that and, and provide another source saying, and these farms have not been tested yet, even mm. though farms in the Netherlands have been. It seems that the majority of people would be receptive to that kind of, of general information messaging. Um, I think jumping too far ahead, um, the, the danger would be, you know, if, if if people went to a message like, we need to ban mink farms in BC because of COVID, where there's just too much missing knowledge right now in the public, mm -hmm. where you need to sort of walk them through those steps, right? Mink can contract. And, you know, so like you say, people are saying, oh, I didn't even, even know that. And our poll is sort of saying, well, people don't even really understand the link between COVID and, and an animal agriculture more broadly. Um, so, yeah. And even with those kinds of paragraphs, going back to the earlier um, idea that people will just sort of dismiss information they don't like, um, even with a well-sourced, you know, informative paragraph, you still find, you know, a small, small group of people who find the information misleading or annoying or talk about it on social media. But that's just sort of the, the nature of, of the game. And I think most people, if you present them with, with valid information, with proper sources, that, that meets them where they're at and helps them take the next few steps. Yeah. And that sort of incremental building knowledge, building awareness kind of approach, um, that sort of seems to, to be the best and, and lead to fewer of those kind of backfires. Well, and that's... People kind of react negatively, right? And that's, that's in line um, with... And you, you'll probably know the study I'm referencing. I don't remember what it was exactly, but it was something about confronting people with two sets of pharma, pharmaco pharmacological data about drugs or, right. or a vaccine or something. And right. the one group, when they were given like citations and information showing it was opposing their view, they wouldn't accept right. it still. Yeah. Uh, I don't know the validity of what I just said. I have heard it and I'm hoping you have also heard it, but it, it, it kind of makes sense in that way of, well, no, this is contrary to what I believe and yeah. you need time to process that. Uh, again, I yeah. just think of my personal experiences, right? Like I, I very rarely change significant well-held beliefs or long-held beliefs because yeah. of one paragraph. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's definitely tough. Um, and we see with all sorts of, um, all sorts of topics, we see uh, resistance to new information, mm -hmm. we see backfire effects, right, where you, um, you message in a certain way, and people actually become more polarized, right. So the people who are initially resistant, even dig in their feet and, yep. and become further away from from where you're trying to get them to get basically, right. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and that's why understanding, you know, where people are, which of their beliefs are sort of related to the willingness to change. Can you shift any of those beliefs? What kind of messaging do you need to shift those beliefs? It's, it's all sort of stuff where, um, you can go, well, this is the type of argument that would work for me, right? I, I see a well-cited paragraph. I check a couple of the sources and, you know, looks good to me kind of thing. Other people, um, are, are living in a different sort of way of accessing information, right? So what, what seems like it would definitely work to you or I might not be what actually works for people who hold those beliefs. And so it's, it's tempting to just go with this, the sort of sledgehammer approach and go, well, I think this would work. Clearly this would work. My friends agree with me that this would work, right? Um, and launching a campaign on that basis or going, okay, let's, let's go and find out where people are um, and test it in small groups. And does this approach work better than that approach? And then we can say, okay, well, let's, let's say to advocates, let's say to people who are, who are trying to make the change. Well, you know, in this sample, using this methodology, this worked best, right? Yeah. So we think for these reasons, however, and it's again, that cautious sort of scientific approach, but it's building that knowledge based on empiricism, based on science, rather than just what we think might work, especially in a situation, like you say, that's really polarized and where, um, where people are, are just as likely to, to dig their heels in as they are to, to change, right? So, 
Uh, yeah, and I thought it I, just uh, for sort of a final note on that, I, I thought it was interesting in reading this summary and all of this information we're talking about is available at fonalytics.org and is linked in the show notes for everyone who wants to read it. And I suggest you do because it's yep. very interesting um, <laughs> and very valuable, especially this part. Uh, so you talked about the misleading, annoying or offensive. So people who find mm -hmm. the arguments that a, a number of people can, were like, yeah, OK, this makes sense, right, by a majority yeah. of participants. Yep. But there was that subset of people who felt misle misled, annoyed, or offended. And yep. there wasn't an uh, – this is the – in even in the absence of an advocacy message like go vet or reduce yep. your meat consumption. I think that's very valuable. So even without the – and yep. this is what we want you to do about it. Yeah. People were still like, no, this is – they were, they were upset, negatively received this information without advocacy, just pure information. Yeah, yeah. And that's why, like, one of the main take-homes from the study was it's time for, for properly cited good information yeah. to, to get out there. And once we have that building block, right, once once enough people understand, once that that basic, you know, here are the links between COVID and animal agriculture messages is better understood among the people who are going to be receptive to the message. Then you can start building on top of that foundation and taking further steps. But yeah, given um, given how few people seem to be aware at that point, um, and hopefully that's that's improving, um, and the the potential, like you say, for for backfire effects. We think it's it's uh, it's it's a time for for caution and for education, basically. Yeah. Um, and there's there's a lot more to this poll that people can get into. There's two quick ones I wanted to touch on. Um, sure. One was food availability changing. Uh, we should not expect overall animal product consumption to change substantially, although some right. individuals may shift their behavior. I have heard so many people yeah. speculating <laughs> about this, and yeah. I have avoided it because I don't know. I, I don't know how yeah. food supply chains work fully, and I don't know. You know, if I were still a meat eater, would I still be going out and buying barbecue stuff? My answer is probably, but yeah, um, yeah. What was what was the sort of the impetus and the result of this? Yeah, so we we were just trying to sort of understand whether, and this is part of that. How much do people understand where this disease came from? Mm -hmm. Right. If they've made the link to animal agriculture more, um, then perhaps they're going to be moving their diet in that direction. Um, but it wasn't from a, a supply chain um, and, and like availability perspective at that point. We hadn't started running into those issues. Okay. Um, but what we found was that about the same number of people were saying that they were going to reduce their meat intake as we're saying that they were going to make no change or, or increase, right? Which isn't necessarily that surprising um, where um, in uncertain times, you know, trying to, to get people to – to try something new can be a bit of a tough sell, right? Because yep. people, uh, and this is sort of just, you know, anecdotally, I a study doesn't come to mind, but, you know, I think people tend to just become more conservative and, and stick with what they know. Oh, definitely. Uh, yeah. I yeah. think that's very now, fair to stay, say. Yeah. So there's been a lot of speculation. Our poll was sort of saying we shouldn't expect much of a shift at all, but there's been information coming out that some of the, the big alternative um, companies like Beyond, et cetera, are seeing massive increases in sales, which mm -hmm. is absolutely fantastic. We're in that sort of, what does this mean? Will this continue after um, after COVID's done? Will this continue after meat is more readily available? Because certainly some products were sold out, and so people might have been buying more of the alternative products just because of that. But maybe that was just the little nudge they needed where they already kind of knew in the back of their head for yeah. health reasons, for the environment, for animal ethical reasons. And then they try it and go, hey, that's really tasty, right? But this is one of those situations where it's uh, the, the the we don't have all the information yet to know whether this this uptake in uh, uptick in uptake will will continue. Um, so I'd say cautious optimism is probably yeah. the, the, the the call. I think that makes sense, and that's you know my experience so far with this too has been some people asking me, "Hey, can I reduce my meat or my meat? What's that like?" Uh, right. And those those were the same conversations I had right before I went vegan several years ago, right? Like, right. Yeah. as you learn more, something causes you to question it. Um, yeah. And it's not an immediate change. Uh, it is a yeah. significant lifestyle change in some ways for some people. I grew up in a yeah. meat and potatoes family, um, yeah. right? Like, we had chicken four nights of the week and we had meatloaf the other three nights of the week. Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, so for me, that, that it was, it was a significant lifestyle change. I went from eating triple cheeseburgers in my car as a journalist uh, for lunch every day and a hungry man dinner for dinner two hours before bed to yeah. eating. I, I still don't eat healthy. Let's, let's be very, very clear. <laughs> Veganism does not equate healthiness, but yeah, yeah. you know, I did like, I dropped some weight. I feel better. Everything improved for my health, but the process was not a black and white. Here's the switch. Let's go. Uh, and I also enjoy the way you're talking about it. And there could be all of these different things or some combination of them because it's very rarely one thing. And that's kind of where my, my mind's been too, is people speculate, well, why is Gardein product sold out? Is it because, mm. you know, non meat eat or sorry, meat eaters are buying it now, or is it because of the border issues and transportation issues? Like I know some food products they've had issue simply because they don't have the drivers, like the right, transportation yeah. infrastructure has been hit by this too. So yeah. you've got products sitting on a shelf. And if it's a product that spoils, that's the reality. Uh, but yeah. again, like you said, this this could be the opportunity. I've been recommending Satan to everybody I know. Yeah. Like if, if you're worried about protein right now, if you're worried about getting enough bulk in your diet, Satan is a brilliant solution. I make it every week. I love yeah. it. Um nice. I'm allergic to wheat, so oh I, no, yeah, Satan to me is like Satan. Yeah, just, that's fair. That's <laughs> yeah, very fair. Yeah, uh, yeah, my wife loves it. So <laughs> yeah, uh, well, tofu, same thing, right? Yeah. Make your own yeah. tofu if you want. Uh, yeah. And then the other one was in the time of pandemic. Some people are more likely to donate to animal charities. Some are less likely. This has been a raging debate in yeah. nonprofits for the last two months, uh, yeah. particularly those of us who are not frontline. Um, right. It, it, I, 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 I was completely, I had no idea what to expect. Yeah. And at this point, I still don't know what to expect. Uh, yeah. what, what did you find through the, uh, the polling? Yeah. So similar, um, most people saying they weren't going to make a change and then about equal proportion saying that they would increase donations to charities, decrease donations, that sort of thing. Um, we we wanted to include the question, you know, if, if people were across the board massively saying that donations were going to decrease, then obviously charities need to start thinking about that and planning for that. We do think that, you know, the, the results that we have should be taken with a grain of salt just because um, in 2008, eight nine the, the last sort of major recession, mm -hmm. donations did decrease. So people's intentions to donate at some point through the year in late March of 2020 may not be where they are when they usually reach for their checkbook in, in November or December, right? Yeah. Um, so it's one of those, here's a piece of information based on where we're at now. <laughs> we're going to need more pieces of information going forward. And, you know, our charities and, and nonprofits seeing a decrease in donations, seeing an uptick, which ones are, are, are heading in the right direction, which ones are, are really sort of struggling. Um, but we just, and it was one of the things that, that people were interested in in the poll, like obviously advocates and, and nonprofit organizations are, are looking at this, like every other organization going, yep. oh no, what, how, how are we going to get through this kind of thing? So it's it was an early piece of information. I would say it's sort of equivocal information. And I'd say definitely we need to be following up on that and keeping a close eye on it for sure. Yeah, the one that got me was the talk about Giving Tuesday in, I guess it was March to, or April, right? When we did Giving right, Tuesday yeah. again. They did the second one, yeah. Um, and everyone was talking about, well, Giving Tuesday is so great for us when we do it. It's like, yeah, but that's in November with weeks of planning and everybody yeah. knowing about it. You can't compare November yeah. of last year to, to March of this year. It's, it's a, literally a different world. Yeah, uh, yeah. And that's, again, that's just the frustrating reality of, of living through this pandemic is we don't know. Uh, but it's good to see that there is this sort of mixed mixed result from the the american selection um yeah it could have been much more negative right yeah um and so again like you know it's a snapshot of one one point in time and it depends you know some of it will depend on what kind of stimul stimulus packages end up coming out right where people don't know governments don't know all of that kind of stuff how quickly we're able to return to work do we find medications that work do we have a vaccine so i think you know, in, in a changing, rapidly evolving situation, um, it's a piece of information. We need more information for sure. But yeah. Uh, yeah. 
Well, and speaking of information, um, finding good information is growing more and more difficult, in my opinion. Um, yeah. Especially with the ease of creating websites um, with <laughs> yeah. with and I'm not going to name anyone or anything, but <laughs> those that add the word news to their name and don't follow any of the tenets of journalism, for example, right. they don't corroborate yeah. or fact check or, or cite or anything. Yeah. Um, so when I'm asked, I always I go to CBC for Canadian news and BBC for world news. Those are my starting points every day. Um, yeah, they are rely or they I should say of the available journalism. They are highly reliable. Um, right. yeah. There is always that room for error. There is always bias. Those always sure. exist no matter where you get your news. Yeah. But I wanted to ask you where you go or where you recommend people can go to get sort of some general up-to-date information on the science or policy, policy side of coronavirus news right now. Yeah, it's a tough one. And I think that um, because of some of the limitations of, of the news media's reporting on science, Mm -hmm. um, where, you know, one sort of, st one study might be presented as, as having more weight than it should based on sample size or, you know, what they did with the control group or any one of 17 different things, right? Um, that listening to the experts, like the people whose job it is to have waded through not just one study or two studies or three studies, but the sum total of available information, mm -hmm. um, and come to what they feel are, are the appropriate recommendations. Um, it, it becomes more difficult where you have, you know, different provinces approaching things different ways, different countries approaching things in different ways. And, and you know, it's tempting to go, well, the one that I prefer is definitely the right way, right? Whereas, you know, people have pointed to the sweetest approach and that kind of stuff, right? Yeah. Um, but yeah, certainly any, any source of information needs to be sort of uh, considered and vetted um, we have, there's mediafactcheck.com is a website and they sort of show you where's the political lean yep. of this outlet and how generally reliable are they? Like even, you know, Pulitzer Prize winning organizations like the Washington Post are, are going to have retractions from time to time, right? Mm -hmm. They're going to report on a study that then doesn't get supported by subsequent research, but that's just the nature of, of, of scientific research, right? Where... Um, it's about the the sort of sum total of the the picture that's shown across multiple studies, multiple labs over time, all of that. So it, it's definitely tough. I would say that any um, any one piece of information should be taken with a grain of salt, and that grain of salt should be larger or smaller depending <laughs> on the organization that it's coming from and how well they're citing their sources. And did they talk to people who weren't involved in the study to get their perspective on it, like other experts in the field to see what they thought about it? It's not peer reviewed, right? In the, in the classic scientific sense where you send it off and it's blind and it's, it's newspaper peer reviewed where they find another epidemiologist who wasn't involved or virologist who wasn't involved yeah. in master opinion. So it's, it's, it's better. It's not perfect. And yeah, each individual piece of information should be sort of this study suggests not demonstrates or proves or any of that other language. It's all like, huh, interesting kind of thing. But like, wait until three, four, five, six, seven studies are all saying the same thing and go, okay, that's probably, probably the way things are. Right. Yeah. And that also introduces us to the world of funding issues related to studies disproving something or not always, or, or studies with without positive results are not always talked about and don't receive the same kind of funding and on and on and on. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I know it's a, a dissatisfying answer at the end of the day to say, we sort of wait for the scientists to hash it out. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, the science produces the, the most objective information possible, right? Like yeah. the, the approach, if done properly, science is a tool, just like a hammer, just like stats. But as long as science is done properly, it, it gives you the, the strongest evidence. Um, but yeah, it's, it's frustrating to sort of go, well, guys, figure it out. But the, the good news is like the scientists of the world really are working on this, right? And trying to, trying to, trying to figure this thing out as, as quickly as possible. So the, the, it is, I, I can't quantify the amount of science being thrown at this pandemic yeah. right now. Like yeah. it's, it is, I, has there been a time other than world war two since this much effort has been given to a single scientific effort? Do you think? 
Oh, uh, I am not <laughs> qualified to answer that. I, 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 I think you should have figured out by now. I want wild speculation from my right. guests. <laughs> okay. Well, for, from wild speculation, <laughs> I think probably because of the urgency, right? Where we haven't had a serious pandemic like this since 1918, right? Yeah. Um, I'm just trying to think of any other topic like climate change comes to mind, but mm. that's been dealing with that for 20, 30, 40 years now, right? Yeah, and it's also so, very broad, right? Like there's a lot true. of areas of study related to climate change. True. And, you know, do you say cancer? Well, what all do you include in cancer? So let's just say there's a massive concerted, yeah. <laughs> concerted effort right now, and I think that's non-controversial. So. Yes, that's that's a, a, a good way to conclude that um yeah <laughs> and then for the final question how do people get involved i mean Fonalytics puts out a lot of great research a lot of great content um i get the Fonalytics updates in my email which i recommend everyone else do how can people help though in in this instance of sort of developing the knowledge on the animal and advocacy side of covid and just in general supporting Fonalytics? yeah so Great question. Um, so yeah, we're a nonprofit organization. We do research that supports advocates, research that helps people understand what the issues are and how to approach them the best way possible. So there are a couple of ways that people can help. Uh, we have really great volunteers, so people with scientific backgrounds who can help us write summaries of, of research that we didn't do ourselves. So we have a, a huge library of, of summaries of other people's research that mm -hmm. are that's relevant to, to advocates. and. Um, our volunteers are absolutely instrumental in, in writing those summaries um, and helping us get get information out in a in a way, so scientific information out in a way that can be accessed by the people who would use it most, right? Um, we love it when people share our work, join our newsletters, but share our work on social media or share with their friends or other advocates who might be interested. Um, and of course, donations are always appreciated too. Um, and as you say, if people just want to check out our website, see some of our research, we have other resources. So we have office hours for advocates who are maybe faced with running a study or interpreting a study and, and want to talk to us about that. Um, we have resources, you know, fundamental guides on, on wildlife trade and on companion animals. Um, so lots of stuff on the website that people can check out and have a, have a cruise through and see who we are and what we do, basically. To read the full breakdown of the poll and to find out more about the awesome work done by Tom and his colleagues at Faunalytics, visit faunalytics.org. That's fauna, like the animals, and lytics, like analytics. Don't worry, links are provided in the show notes for this week. I want to thank Tom for joining me and the Faunalytics team for organizing this interview. I receive the Faunalytics Blasts every week and strongly suggest any advocate interested in learning more about helping the animals do the same. Remember, you can follow me on social media for updates about the show, the Fur Bears, JJ the Hamilton Hound, and my occasional and sporadic art projects. Find me at Defender Radio on Facebook and Twitter and at Howie Michael on Instagram. I hope everyone out there is staying safe and healthy, and we'll be back soon with more on coyotes, bears, and more. Until next time, I'm Michael Howie for Defender Radio and the Fur Bears reminding you to be kind and to stay informed and stay strong. Defender Radio.